And I, I find this to be like one of the hardest things to do when uh, working on like large core bases day in day out. But I try to keep it in the back of my mind. So and I really encourage everyone, like if you, you know, on Monday or whenever you go back to work, kind of, you know, take a step back, look at the code base, think about where are your problems. And um, is there maybe even problems that I introduced uh, and made it more complex or more than necessary. So um, I kind of touched on architecture already, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the changes from like uh, yeah, yeah, we're undergoing in our application. So I remember when I started, like about two years ago at SoundCloud, um, the first feature we had to implement were playlists. So where you could organize your tracks into playlists. And it sounded pretty straightforward. We had all the kind of basic things already there. You know, we had our database schema in place, and um, you know, the UIs were pretty easy to extend to deal with that. But it still it took three months to build this feature and ship it. And I kind of thought, I kind of then thought, like, why did this take so long? And like, a lot of the reasons were because of what I just described already. It was too difficult to work with the existing concepts we had established in the code base. And there was like uh, a lot of like, you know, guard objects trying to take way too many responsibilities at once and um, being called from each and every other object. And there was like no good separation of concerns at all. Um, no clear like layers. So um, there was database access and views and stuff. And it was all kind of very nice. And so the first thing we started doing, which is pretty obvious, we started to pull in layers into our uh, application that made it very, very clear uh, where certain things belong. So um, it's it's really not rocket science. So we have like a presentation layer, which is really just contains views, reference, and presenters, uh, which are only um, uh, responsible for displaying stuff from a given data source. We have like the application of the logic layer, which is responsible for um, yeah uh, delivering data uh, in the fashion to the UI that um, the UI doesn't have to know anything about the data sources that are underneath. And um, yeah, last but not least, we have like a, a data layer that also does better sort of operates, uh, which involves networking uh, database. Uh, a bit more interesting thing is we started to do this as well. So we have a script in our application now. Uh, we used to um, structure our code uh, based on technical concerns. So we would have like packages like these are all our activities, these are all our fragments, um, you know, this is our code related to API and stuff. And um, this kind of introduce, introduces a lot of friction in features, especially if you, at some point, <coughs> plan to grow your team and maybe split them up in multiple feature teams. Um, you will get a lot of friction because you always have to work like a across the entire uh, package uh, matrix. So what we do now is we um, package up the code by based on features. So we have like a search package. We have um, a package related to discovery or explore feature. Um, yeah. Like, Something like that. So this actually helped a lot as well into getting like uh, structure and responsibility, clear responsibilities back into our um, code base. Um, so if you if you think about you know what I've um, said so far and how we start to um, structure the code, um, there was like a pretty clear desire to think about um, uh, first of all like how do we deal with the concurrent um, delivery of data into the into the UI layer, which was supposed to be like very lightweight and. Yeah, uh, kind of um, like free of any kind of logic. <coughs> and um, how can we do that using kind of a uniform model so that we can propose these low level events and uh, transport them to the UI in a full way? And um, so, yeah, that was like, I think about a year and a half ago, a co worker um, introduced me to this idea of um, functional reactive programming. Um, back then, based on Reactive Proco, which is um, a library. Uh, GitHub ported from the project called Rx, which I'm going to yeah, talk about a bit later. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, um, I'm not sure if there's any like functional hardcore or Haskell programmers in the audience. Not Haskell. Okay, so I actually sneaked on this slide because <laughs> um, apparently there was a bit of a debate around whether Rx is actually functional programming. It's not functionally pure. It's definitely not because it has the notion of side effects and stuff. Um, but um, when I see like reactive programming, uh, this guy, super funny dude, Eric Meyer, he's the inventor of um, Rx. If you ever happen to catch a talk with him, I highly recommend it. It's um, both hilarious and, and very, very um, uh, uh, interesting as well. And yeah, so uh, I think uh, FRP is still a good description if you want to contrast it to like traditional imperative um, or, uh, programming based on like traditional objects. Uh, but um, yeah, so like the purist might not agree with that. 
So this is kind of my segue into um, Rx Java now as well. Uh, which, yeah, uh, we have talked about a bit already yesterday, um, but um, I want to give uh, some examples as well on user. And um, just to recap, uh, in case you don't remember, so Rx Java um, came courtesy of Netflix, but the initial, it's actually the fork uh, of the React extensions, which were originally built um, by Eric Meyer and a couple other people at Microsoft for the .NET platform. And um, their goal was to um, kind of uh, simplify uh, yeah, exactly these problems that I described before, uh, dealing with asynchronous uh, uh, sources of information and kind of, uh, kind of uh, come up with like a standard model of um, transporting this data through your application. And um, I kind of like to think of it, you, you can break RxJava down into some very fundamental uh, concepts, which are just really just a few, but if I would have to describe it in a, on a very high level way, I would say if you, if you think about all the kind of data points, all the events in your applications, and how they traverse your application over time. Now imagine you, put, you would put them all in the list or some kind of collection, and then you would be able to filter over that list or you know, take subsets over that list, and uh, you would have someone only ever listen for uh, the result of these event streams. And this is kind of what RxJava is about. So um, at the very bottom, you have what RxJava calls an observable sequence. Uh, which you can think of as basically a push-based iterator. Um, it has like a very similar API to a uh, Java iterator, uh, just that it's reversed, so it's kind of a dual uh, to an iterator. So instead of having a next function where you pull in like uh, manually the next item from a collection, you have an on-next call which um, pushes out an item uh, of the sequence to an observer that subscribes to it. And there can be multiple observers subscribed to it. So we have this kind of layering of uh, kind of an emission layer, which is your initial sequence, and then uh, a layer through which you deliver or transform these events, and then on the top you have kind of the observers that just react to the output of this. And um, there's also a standard model for failing sequences by delivering an on-error notification, which takes a throwable. So the nice thing about this is it will traverse the entire sequence. So if you fail your sequence, uh, it's guaranteed to arrive at your subscriber, and it doesn't matter at which point in time or through which step uh, it actually failed. So this is like the whole messaging protocol behind RxJava, and it's really universally applicable to a lot of um, cases. And um, it, it's like there's like some symmetry to this model, which makes it um, compositional, which is super super powerful. And this is where the functional aspect comes in. So what you can do is um, RxJava has this notion of operators. So you can take any sequence and um, apply any number of operators to it. So, and the way it works is you start with your initial, initial sequence down at the bottom and you emit an item. And if you have an operator applied to it, uh, it will act as an observer to this item, but it will do something with it. So it might transform this item and then forward the results to whoever is next in the listening chain. So, um, um, yeah, so in that way you can kind of uh, you can you can step this up and if you want, right? So you can keep combining your sequences and keep uh, transforming them. And uh, whatever pops out at the top at your observer um, is, is going to be um, totally transparent. Like the observer doesn't really know anymore like, where it came from. So this can, can be very powerful. And the way, um, the canonical way, um, Rx, the Java at least, um, um, plots these uh, sequences the operators in the documentation is what they call a model diagram. Uh, I think it's a very nice way of visualizing how these things work. So um, at the top again, you have the source sequence, and so every model in there is a call to unmask, if you think of this. So it's an item that we emit from the sequence. And <clears throat> if you apply an operator like map, uh, I've said it has like dozens of operators, but map is a fundamental one which, if you know it from like functional languages, it just takes some input and turns some output of the same or a different type. So um, you can apply the map operator, give it a function that turns models into diamonds, and then suddenly you have a sequence of diamonds. And so this is kind of how, how it works like, with all the operators. And um, so if, I, I'm going to put this a little bit more into practice because this is pretty abstract, I guess. But this is pretty much taken for a from our um, code base. And um, so if, like, we do this a lot in the application layer. So we have um, objects which um, take like various data sources, uh, combine them, maybe filter them, and then deliver the result to the UI. 
So if, for instance, we load a trap somewhere, um, we identify traps for URNs, so uh, we pass in a URN and call this um, track function. And what it does is, in this case, it, um, it uh, starts with a sequence which loads the track from local storage. So track from storage is, a, is an example of the sequence as well. And um, we then call the toList operator on it, which means um, if it receives one item, it returns a list of one element. Or if it re receives no item, it returns an empty list. Um, this is nice because um, collections like this are a bit easier um, to work with than the, you know, the fact that there is an item or the fact that there was no item. And then we can use the flat map operator to turn this into an entirely different sequence. And what this means is with the list, so we, we pass in another um, a sequence constructor to flat map, which says if this list was empty because you didn't find the track in local storage, uh, then uh, trigger a metadata sync and fetch it from the API and store it in local storage. And, um, and then try again to load it. So if we take this entire construct, um, at least you know, include the operators that we apply to it, the caller, it's all declarative, the caller can just take this function, subscribe an observer to it, and receive um, the track without actually knowing like, where it came from. So it might have been already been presented in the database, in which case we admit it right away, or uh, we might have to have triggered sync to fetch it from, from the network and uh, cache it locally and then the spot it back into the UI. So this allowed us to take a lot of complexity uh, for dealing with like absent cases and stuff out of the UI. And whenever there's an error occurring in any of these steps, uh, we can make sure that the subscriber uh, will be informed by this through the one-year outcome. So um, I also want to say something about um, composition again, because one interesting thing to notice is uh, if you think about object-oriented systems, then traditionally um, your unit of uh, your unit of reuse and your unit of composition is the class usually. But if you do this more like functional style, um, the unit of composition or reuse becomes a function actually. So if, if you, we have the second method here, which says full track, which we use for instance on the player uh, to show like all the details we have around a given track on SoundCloud, which includes like the full text description, which can be pretty long. Like we usually don't want to load this if we load a track into the into a, um, into like a list on the screen, for instance. <coughs> so. Um, but we can start with the same observable sequence, which loads it from local storage, and then we can use the zip operator to uh, make another call to the database, which loads the full data, and then we can combine them using the merge function. And, but again, like to the caller, it makes no difference. Like they, they will just get you know, what they ask for. Uh, but we can kind of recompose our, um, our like, different data sources here in a super neat way. Um, and a really important concept as well, um, in RxJava is um, the concept of schedulers. So basically, if you look at this function that I just showed you, if you wouldn't apply a scheduler, they would just run synchronously. So if I would subscribe to them, uh, they would just fire right away. It would be a synchronous call like this local currency ball. Um, so what RxJava allows you to do is you can, uh, you can provide a scheduler to run your code elsewhere. So you can say, take this description of how to do something, my task pretty much. And, but we're running on like a new thread, for instance. So because I don't want to do database, I open the main thread. But I want to receive the result on the UI thread, right? Because you know, at the end of the day, I want to take my track or whatever and I want to display it you know, in the UI. So I can tell it, deliver all the notifications um, to my subscriber on the main UI thread. And RxJava, like, um, it um, expresses this using the same concepts. So it's, it's again just an operator to call. So subscribe on and observe on. They work in much the same way as a map or flat map. You, know, you just you know pass it a scheduler and then it does it. So again, this is nice for testing as well because you can take the exact same function that I showed before and in the unit test you can use the immediate scheduler or like no scheduler at all and we'll just run synchronously. And um, since concurrency is not parametric, you can just omit it in the unit test. So you don't have to do all these RoboElectric style hacks where they have like a background, you know, like they replace async tasks and kind of cut out the concurrency in the background. Because like here, it's already part of the API to keep doing this. Um, of course, then there's the question around um, decoupling the caller from um, the, yeah, the stream of, of, of items that you want to emit. Um, because maybe not every time you, can, you have direct access to the source sequence or something like right? um, Especially if you think about if you have an Android background service running, uh, which might you know, maybe fetch an image or something in the background, and you want to deliver this to the UI, how do you do that? Because there's no direct connection between your, or there shouldn't be a direct connection between your presentation 
uh, layer at the background service. So um, what we did is we uh, built an event bus based on Rx Java as well, which is really simple uh, because it's, I kind of look at, at, you know, if you take at least the basic concept of message passing, then this becomes kind of like a subset of the uh, functionality of Rx. And Rx provides a very helpful class called the subject um, down here, um, which you can think of as like a, a pipe pretty much. So it has two ends and you can stuff data into it from, from the bottom and you can um, uh, receive data on the other side. So without both ends kind of having knowledge of each other. Um, so the way we use this is, um, yeah, we use Dagger as well. So we um, inject an event bus on the receiving side and we just subscribe a subscriber, et cetera, to um, a particular event queue, uh, which is type, which is nice, it's all type safe. And um, yeah, in my on next call my subscriber, I can then react to this event. And, and I have no knowledge of the actual sender that puts data into the queue. And on the sending side, again, I inject my event bus, it has to be a single thing. Um, uh, I can publish this queue like in a very similar way. And this again comes all, you know, comes with all the nice things that RxJava gives you, like uh, error handling, for instance. So if anything goes wrong, I still have my standard on error calls so I can react to. Um, okay, so um, so much about RxJava. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, local storage as well, since we use it so heavily. And I kind of mentioned already that we um, that we kind of replaced our storage APIs multiple times. And um, so what we finally did is we built um, our own. And um, uh, yeah, it's a library called Propeller. And it's it's a very, if you, if you put it in a sentence, a very lightweight um, wrapper around the SQLite database. So it doesn't use kind of provider or anything. Um, it just kind of embraces SQLite as a pretty awesome database and just tries to be a more convenient than what Android gives you out of the box. So um, the actual reason though, that, yeah, like the name actually came about because um, it didn't actually start as a full-fledged like storage library, um, but it started around uh, an idea that we introduced to our code base for how we model data that we um, propagate through the application, and uh, we call these properties and property sets. So I want to talk a little bit about <coughs> this one. Um, so it, who here actually use like databases in, 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 in our application? Oh, quite old, right? Okay, quite a few people. Um, so I'm pretty sure like you're familiar with um, this pattern. So I, I've seen it so many times, and we did this as well in the past. So we have some kind of business object, uh, you know, that resembles usually an entity in your um, in your product. It puts like a track on SoundCloud. The track is a title, and maybe it, it's related to a user, right? So we have a user concept here as well. And what ORMs do, um, they would have like. Um, you know, they have like a, a save or store method on this object and a load method. So it's all like symmetric. And or you would have like a you know a repository like a storage class um, that takes like a track object, knows how to store it, to store it in the database, and um, load the same thing from the database again. Pretty pretty standard. The problem with this is um, twofold. Um, first of all, it, it makes it very easy to leak information into other layers that shouldn't leave these layers. Um, if you, for instance, fetch these entities from your API, so you have a track coming from your network and it kind of traverses through your business logic and then it goes back to storage maybe and comes back out and then you're probably very inclined to also deliver it to the presentation layer. So um, there's a pretty good chance that you start coupling uh, layers to each other in terms of, of these models, which is a smart way of doing And um, another problem with these is that um, they are very static, right? Uh, if we think about these compositional aspects that I mentioned earlier, I, I cannot possibly compose those. So if, I, if I'm on like a list view, for instance, and I only need like three fields from this entity, and maybe two fields from my user, uh, I still have to load the entire thing from the database, right? Um, which is not efficient, right? Then I load all this stuff into memory that I don't need in my list. Um, or I might not do this and use the same model, and then half of the fields come back as null or something, which raises a lot of questions about stability in the application. And, um, and we had this in the past a lot, so we had a lot of like, you know, presentation objects or views uh, that would constantly check things for null because, oh yeah, we're not actually sure if this property is now set or not. Um, so yeah, it was really difficult to reason about your code, like when data was available or not. So um, uh, I want to um, then quickly talk about an architectural pattern that uh, Martin Fowler described in this blog, which has like a really uh, complicated name. It's called uh, Query, um, 
uh, responsibility segregation. Uh, it's a very elaborate name for a very simple idea. Um, and the idea basically is you simply completely separate uh, your reads from your writes in your application. So basically the code that's responsible for writing something is completely separate and uses even separate data structures from the um, code that reads data. And that's a very good reason for this. So the first reason I mentioned earlier already is uh, we use, for instance, um, uh, separate models now for our uh, backend resources or entities. So whenever we get back from the API, we just serve it around to um, a write storage class, uh, which knows how to persist this object into uh, the database, but it never leaves that layer. Um, on the other hand, um, what we do now is we have a read storage class, which for instance can uh, load track data in using various kind of views, if, if you want. So basically, various kind of levels of composition over the, uh, over the data backend. And this is what we call a property set. And, um, so the way I think about how we arrived at property set was we kind of started with a traditional business object, you know, with your fields, and you would instantiate it, and then you set a bunch of values of it, etc. Uh, but if you want to get out of like static hierarchy of objects, um, especially if you have to manage these like foreign references to other objects in their entirety, um, what if we were to Instead of thinking about the whole class as the anti, you know as the level of granularity, we pull every field, uh, we, we take it down to the field level. So we think of every field in the class as like a first class citizen, and this is what a property is. So um, if we would turn this class into some aggregate type, which is not essential, but which could be an interface or an abstract class, uh, we now model every um, yeah, property that we have in the business domain under a given concept like a track. Uh, individually, and um, so this is more like uh, what databases do actually. So we have, for instance, it's a denormalized view, so we don't have a full user view anymore on the track, but we know a track is related to a user, so we have a property that points to a URN which identifies the user. And um, what this allows us to do is we can create various views over, over this data uh, using a set type. Um, it's, it's not a normal map, uh, but it's a set type that is uh, type safe over its keys, uh, which is a desirable property, I guess. And so what we can do is we can say, oh, for my list view on the sound screen, for instance, I only need these bunch of fields, so I just take what I need, right? And um, I put it into a set, and then I bind this to my views. Uh, so I don't have to deal with these full model classes. And I reduce um, friction as well between feature packages, because on a different screen that belongs to a different feature, they may have completely different requirements for the, the, the amount of data that they display. And it has a couple other desirable properties. Um, we can make it a bit safer to obtain data. So we have a couple of um, kind of safety net methods. So by default, if you get something out of a set, uh, it will throw if it doesn't exist, because we really wanted to cut down on the, we wanted to fail fast if, uh, if like, data is missing that you think should be there. But we have, similar to the option type in Lava, we have like something like get or else, where you can say, okay, give me this fallback if the property is missing from the set, which is nice in view model sciences, so that you can supply a fallback screen. Um, or if you, may, you want to make it super explicit and you want to deal with no references, which I don't recommend, uh, then you can say get or else no. And the nice thing is as well as uh, compositional, so I can take many of these sets and can merge them together. And so if I get something from the API and something from local storage, I can combine them and serve them to my views. And then I get exactly the data set that I want. So um, coming back to the library, so it has grown like beyond these data types. So uh, some of the design goals were uh, it should be very, very simple. It should be not biased. I think, for instance, ORMs are very biased towards how you have to structure your code, you know. Um, and uh, it was based on the idea of kind of tying in nicely with uh, a reactive, or Java in particular. So it has a synchronous API by default, which is evolved from iterators. Uh, but uh, it has like a symmetric API which um, plugs into observables. You can make it push based. So you can uh, push data out of the database into your observers. And again, um, there was a large focus on error handling as well, because if you've worked with you can like the, you know, wrappers by default on Android, they give you minus one or something if it fails, uh, which is not really much you can, can do at all. Um, in terms of queries, so if you, so yeah, actually like if you, the only thing you need to instantiate um, the main propeller object is the SQLite database, so that's, uh, it kind of wraps it away. And then we have a query builder, uh, which is quite powerful, actually. It has like column queries and stuff, like column functions, like can do joins and everything. So it's pretty complete. And um, so what it does, if you if you run a query, it gives you a query result. And unlike uh, standard SQL database or a component provider, 
It doesn't give you a cursor, uh, but this um, query result is iterable. So this has a lot of nice properties because if you iterate on the entire result, it will automatically close the cursor. So this is more fault tolerant because then you can forget to close the cursor of the database. And, um, and moreover, it's um, symmetric to the uh, Java Clutches API. So uh, for instance, Guava has a lot of really nice helpers to deal with um, collections in Java, which you cannot apply to a cursor, for instance, because they have this own like weird interface, uh, which is not in line with the iterator interface in, in Java. Uh, whereas this is, so you can just treat it as a collection. And um, if you want to, you know, go above a level of like reading every row at a time, a single row at a time, uh, we have this concept of a row mapper. So it's a function uh, that takes a single row of your database, and uh, so it passes in this cursor reader that you can use to read uh, column values, and um, it returns whatever you want to map it to. So for instance, if you use like standard business object, you can map it to like a track object or like to a product set, like I mentioned earlier. And this is very convenient because once you have this mapper, once you know how to map a table to an object, you can just say, um, take a query result and call it to a list with this mapper, and it gives you a list. And like, there's nothing, and you don't have to deal with anything. Or, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, yeah, so you don't have to deal with anything like low level you know, uh, closing uh, cursors and so um, With regards to Rx Java, um, the way it works is there's a separate class called uh, Data Scheduler which exposes the same methods as the um, main object. Uh, just when you instantiate it, it's, it's, like, it's like a decorator around um, the main propeller object, and it takes an RX Java scheduler. So if you call any of the methods, it will give you an observable instead of the query result directly, and it will run it on that given scheduler. Uh, but from there on, it's like the same thing. So you can also then map your uh, row data to like a given object type. So if you create your query using a query builder, you can schedule it and it, it gets quickly observable of um, the type you want to. So um, this is like still a working project. Um, we actually uh, plan to open source this. We haven't yet, like, there's no documentation stuff. <laughs> but um, uh, it's actually like already fairly complete. So we have, um, yeah, I mentioned earlier, like we can join, we can filter uh, all the standard stuff for queries. Um, we have, we go a bit like beyond the standard inserts and stuff that you get with a normal SQLite wrapper. So we have uh, bulk inserts and bulk upserts as well. So an upsert is pretty much, uh, if the data already exists, uh, don't overwrite it, but if it doesn't it's like merge it, it exists data with row data. So we do this a lot, especially if you have sync operations, it's a very useful operation. Um, and we have, uh, on top of the list, we have truncates as well, if you want to reset um, uh, database IDs, uh, truncates in this way. Uh, we have uh, first class support for transactions, uh, which are also a lot nicer than having to, they don't use this manual demarcation that you have to do with a SQLite by default, where you have to say, yeah, start transaction, and then and finally block, um, close it, otherwise you might be resources or uh, roll it back without actually wanting to roll it back. So it's also represented in a more like um, object style. And um, we have test support as well, so if you want to write uh, tests for your uh, database for your storage objects. Uh, there's like test helpers that you can use to write integration tests that make it uh, a bit easier to do that. Okay, um, yeah, this is um, my last slide. So just to um, draw a summary. Um, yeah, I can always say it, it, it took a while for us and we were maybe like 80% there. We pretty much like rebuilt our code base uh, since then. But I think it was like, um, like super useful for us to um, yeah, put all our money on Rx Java pretty much because we started adopting it in its like 0.5 version or something, so it was like an alpha release. So. And yeah, it's been like a tremendous help to reducing uh, this kind of complexity in our code base. And um, yeah, um, I, I kind of like what Rx Java is very, it offers a very fundamental level, it has very simple concepts, and you can, it is really up to you what you build on top of it. So you can build very complex things on top. So um, we build like a, an operator to do paging, for instance. So if you like any list that you use in our application, uh, we'll use an RX Java operator that emits stuff in pages that you might get from the API or the database, which was super helpful as well. And kind of the lesson learned from this was, um, so we had a lot of, like in the beginning, we had a lot of what um, Afi Grimm calls um, MacGyver style development, which is kind of you look left, you look right, and there's like this problem ahead of you that you need to solve. So you take a little bit of this and repurpose it and on this on top of that. And then, then you end up solving your problem as well, that's fine. But uh, if you do that for three years, then it kind of starts to smell. 
And so it's always good, you know, to question your architecture, challenge your architecture. Yeah, every time you implement a new feature, I really recommend it if you want to cut up on the pain. <laughs> yeah, thanks. That's it.